Welcome to your iExplore video over figurative language. Turn to page 52 in your reading journal and let's take notes. I'm just going to briefly explain to you what figurative language is. I think it's amazing. It's a beautiful, beautiful way to say more uh, with more feeling and more depth at the same time to be concise and clear about what you're trying to say. And many texts actually rely on figurative language to give the reader a very visual experience, a very connected experience to what's actually being said. So here's what figurative language means. And it means phrases or words that do not literally mean what they are saying, but are used to highlight similarities and make connections between two sometimes unrelated ideas, usually comparing a new thought or feeling to an idea or thing we already are familiar with in order to help the reader better understand and visualize the author's message or experience. So basically what figurative language does is it makes a statement that does not literally mean what you're saying. For instance, if you said, I'm hungry enough to eat a horse, you're literally not that hungry. That would kill you. But comparing your hunger to being able to eat a horse highlights or emphasizes the extent of your hunger. And so that's what figurative language does. That's why sometimes when we're speaking, we say not literally, I just mean that figuratively, right? So figuratively. <clears throat> and here's some examples below of figurative language, and I'm just going to explain them to you quickly um, because this is just an introductory video. But here's a metaphor, an extended metaphor that we actually read earlier when we talked about controlling an idea. But it says, Daddy says the world is a drum, tight and hard, and I told him I'm going to beat out my, I'm going to beat out my own rhythm by Nikki Giovanni. And I've highlighted the metaphor here, the world is a drum. And so a metaphor you will find the definition later in your reading journal, but it's basically when you say something is something that it else. The world is literally a drum made of hide and used to play music. No way. That is not actually what this metaphor means. It's used to express something, not literally mean what it's saying, but to express the idea. Comparing the world to a drum helps the reader visualize the world as a place where each person can create his or home his or her own meaning to life. And so that's what the metaphor is doing here. It's creating that comparison. So when we stop and think about it, we totally get what's happening. But at first glance, it may be a little vague. It may be a little difficult to understand what figurative language means. So we have to be close readers. We have to look carefully into the text before we can understand what it means when it's used figuratively. Here's an example of irony. I recently saw this written on the inside of a public restroom stall. Three things I hate. Vandalism, list, irony. And let's talk about what's going on here. This list, written on a public restroom wall, which is a case of vandalism, uses irony to make the reader think. So what is this figurative language doing? It's making the reader, <clears throat> the person reading off the bathroom stall in that case, how embarrassing, think. What's ironic about this statement? The speaker utilizes the three things she claims to hate just to make her point and provoke the reader to think about what she has written. We do not need to assume that the reader literally hates these three things. She may or she may not. The point is to make you as the audience think. Her claim that she hates them is part of the irony here. So it's figuratively written. It's, it's used to be ironic and to make you think about what she said. Now, if you turn to the next two pages of your reading journal, page 53 and 54, you're going to find some specific examples of figurative language and their definitions. So let's briefly look over page 53 and 54. So here on page 53, we see the type of figurative language. And then we see a definition for each type. So we have understatement overstatement, paradox. Paradox is one of my favorites. It's so mind-bending. And then this one is super common, metaphor, so for sure you probably know that one from middle school. And then simile. And for each of these particular types of figurative language, you also have an example of them. And then last but not least, we have sarcasm. So I'm just going to read briefly through one of them to kind of explain to you how to look up the definitions of these figurative languages, so how to use this page, but I'm not going to read through all of them. You have to do that on your own. But let's just look at paradox. So it says, a circumstance when two things must both be true, yet cannot be true at the same time. 
This is a very classy philosophical device used most often to cause the reader to think and question reality or what is obvious in a situation. So that first part that I just read, that is basically the definition of the term. So as you read through your reading journal and you look at the figurative language and then what follows, you'll see that the first thing is a definition. And then the second thing is an example. For example, the wooden puppet Pinocchio's nose grows when he lies and only when he lies. So Pinocchio in the fictional fairy tale, he's a puppet who's made of wood and when he tells a lie, his nose grows. If Pinocchio was, were to say, my nose will grow now, and his nose grows, then he has told the truth. So his nose should not have grown, right? Because the nose only grows when he lies. So if he says, my nose will grow now, it should not grow because that is a truthful statement if his nose grows. However, if his nose does not grow, his statement will be a lie and therefore his nose should have grown. Right? So it's a paradox. Neither one can work out as we would expect. Neither one can end up being true. And so what did it say? A paradox is used to make the reader think. So anytime an author includes a paradox in what they've written, it's really to make you pause and think as a reader and to really try to work through if this could happen or not. And there's many real life situational paradoxes as well. Now let's turn to page, to the next page in your journal that has figurative language 3 and that is page 50. And remember you need to read through, don't forget to look back and read over the rest of the types of figurative language on page 53. You'll be doing an activity in class where you need to know the definitions and specific uses of those types of figurative language as well. But here on page 53 we discuss irony and irony is a very complex figurative language and so I've broken it down into several steps. So there are three kinds of irony. Verbal irony which is when you say something like, um, for instance you give someone a nice, nice gift and they don't even say thank you, you tell them, don't go overboard with gratitude, please. So clearly they're not being grateful, you're being ironic, right? Irony is um, when something turns out different than you would expect it to. So you're just gonna read each of these definitions, so verbal irony, read about it. I want you to make sure that you think about verbal irony. There's situational irony, where a situation does not turn out as you would expect, and there's dramatic irony which is from a play um, or a movie where you know something about what's going to happen to the characters that they themselves do not know. So I want you to make sure that you read over those examples of irony so that you are familiar with them. And I don't want to make this video too long. So you take time and read, highlight, and underline, and look at the examples of irony. And then there's controlling images and symbols, which I also love this figurative language, this literary device. Uh, it's when an image, color, or idea appears multiple times throughout a text. I want you to make sure that you read about common symbols. We're going to do a lesson on symbolism as well, and this will kind of introduce you to the idea. So I don't want to go overboard just explaining what's obvious here. I want you to make sure you read these pages. You don't have to memorize it for some kind of a quiz in class. It's something we're going to be using in the activity, though. You need to know where to find it, and you need to understand the difference of the explanation and the examples. So when we do it in class, you're ahead of the game. Enjoy, and I'll see you soon. By the way, don't forget to fill in your table of contents.